I was going to ask you, Professor Boyer, a little bit about what it's been like for you to publish textbooks for a general market uh, at the college level, right, but also at the high school level. I, I think that's something that a lot of historians would be interested in, how, what, what that's like as a process, how that differs from just, you know, writing monographs and what it's been like for you. Right. Well, I, I actually am the author of two textbooks. Uh, the American Nation is a high school textbook, and then I'm co-author of a, of a college-level uh, American history textbook called The Enduring Vision. Uh, it, it is a, a form of historical work that I enjoy a lot. Uh, I wouldn't want to spend my life doing it, but uh, as part of my professional work, it's been quite rewarding. Uh, it involves uh, a lot of reading, synthesizing of other scholars' work, and attempting to uh, shape it into some kind of coherent, readable narrative that will appeal to, to students. So uh, it's, um, it's been an aspect of my career that, uh, that I found quite interesting. You used this, this great metaphor the other night about a bus that's crowded. Uh, and you're the driver of the bus as an author, or one author with many other authors, hands on the wheel. And it's packed full of subjects that you have to cover. Uh, but how do you decide, you know, this is what we're going to cover in the book? These things have to be jettisoned? That's, a, that's an excellent question and probably one of the greatest challenges of textbook writing because history keeps happening. So each new revision of the textbook, new material has to be incorporated simply because events have occurred since the last revision. So there's that, uh, that necessity. Uh, on the other side, publishers are continually press pressing us for uh, more concise books, shorter books. They get complaints, understandable complaints from students that these books are getting so heavy and, you know, it's, it's almost a physical challenge to pick them up sometime. So you get these conflicting pressures of not only new events that need, need to be included, the flow of history, but a new perceptions of what needs to be included in any history textbook, and in this case, an American history textbook. And uh, compared to the textbooks of 50 years ago, for example, issues of, of the diversity of social groups in America, uh, women's history, uh, the history of technology and science, uh, medicine, all of these themes that have been uh, added onto the sort of traditional military, political, diplomatic narrative of a sort of conventional American history textbook of an earlier generation. And I would include in that the, uh, the uh, uh, topic of religious history. And uh, since I'm interested in religious history and church history, and I've been particularly sensitive and aware of that, the importance of including uh, religious history in the master narrative that students encounter when they reading a textbook level treatment of, of American history. But what, well you had mentioned the other night that um, one of the things that's difficult there is that if people have a view of religion as timeless and changeless, but fitting that into a historical narrative where you're trying to, to track change over time, those can kind of go in opposite directions, those um, trying to do both of those at the same time. or. Yeah, that's, that's right. I, I actually thought about this somewhat systematically some years ago and, and wrote an article about it that, that, that was later uh, published uh, in, a, in a book, uh, Religious Advocacy and the Teaching of History, I think was the title, although I'm not, I don't remember for sure. But, but there have been some charges against textbook writers that there's a uh, kind of a uh, conspiracy to downplay religious history, uh, uh, it's sort of related to, to the general culture wars theme that, you know, there's kind of a secular humanism that is a dominant uh, cultural strand in America and, and, uh, and part of that is, uh, is, is, is trying to dismiss the importance of religion. Well, even uh, Jonathan Butler made that great uh, argument in, a, in an article for, I think, the JAH about how religion 
popped up like a jack in the box now and then that's in, right. the, in the post-1877 narrative. That's right. Yeah, that's, a, that's a very good point. Religion has, has always been present in the treatment of the colonial period. You, you mm -hmm. can't deal with New England history without looking at it. It's, it's been present in uh, the treatment of the antebellum period with the, uh, uh, in the 19th century, the temperance reforms, abolitionism, uh, and the social gospel. But, but then at a certain point, uh, it has tended to uh, to sort of fade out, and I think John Jonathan Butler uh, had a valid point there. But as I thought about this question, I I sort of realized there there are various reasons why uh, religious history has perhaps not gotten the attention in textbooks that it that it should that go beyond just whatever secular bias textbook writers have uh, against religion, and and one aspect of it is in, in writing a textbook, textbooks tend to be events driven uh, and those events can be, uh, can be great social movements, uh, political transformations, uh, and when religion has figured into these, into these event uh, cycles, uh, then they appear, the reference to the religion appears. The problem in dealing with the importance of religion in any society or any culture is the sort of daily, daily lived aspects of religion. We know that, that religious faith is enormously important to millions of Americans on a daily, they're in their daily lives. And yet, how do you translate that into a, uh, a sort of master narrative of history that focuses on change rather than continuities. Uh, you don't see many textbooks that say, well, things continue to be very much the same in this period as they were in the past. That's just not the well, way and how do you, historical narratives are structured. 